Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to our first uh, Codex speaker series um, this academic year. And uh, we have an amazing um, speaker with us today, uh, Professor David Engstrom. He is a faculty member um, at Stanford Law School and one of the most distinguished uh, scholars uh, specializing on civil procedure, administrative law, constitutional law, federal courts, and uh, legal history and empirical studies. His current work um, uh, focuses on the intersection of, of law and uh, artificial intelligence. He's, uh, he's working on, a, on an important project on the uh, effects of uh, legal tech tools on, uh, on the civil justice system, governance, lawyering, and access to justice uh, challenges posed by AI. Uh, in addition to his uh, uh, work as a, as a scholar and, uh, and teacher at, at uh, Stanford, uh, he's also serving as our uh, associate dean for strategic in initiatives. Uh, in that role, he's uh, leading our efforts to shape the law school's programs and offerings around law and uh, digital technology. Uh, he's uh, has, uh, a lot more to say. He's, uh, he's uh, widely uh, uh, published and uh, his, uh, his scholarship has been covered in uh, all the major news outlets. Uh, he, uh, in terms of his educational background, he holds a, a JD from, from Stanford Law School, a Master's of Science from Oxford University and a PhD from uh, Professor Engstrom will uh, be talking about uh, legal tech, procedure, and the future of uh, adversarialism. Professor Engstrom, thank you so much for kicking off our speaker series. It's a real uh, pleasure and honor to have you. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. So um, thank you, uh, Roland, um, and thank you to, to Codex, to, to Susan, and everyone else who's been involved in this. Um, I am just really thrilled to be here today. You know, Codex always draws such a cool mix of people from you know, folks in the entrepreneurial space to judges, to practitioners. And so it really is a, a thrill to be here and to have the chance to talk to you about some of my work in this space. So my plan today is to talk relatively long. That's, how, that's my understanding of how uh, these tend to work. Um, so I'm going to do a full presentation and really try to give you a sense of what I've been up to as I've been thinking about legal tech and, and civil procedure and, and the future of adversarialism. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I frankly wouldn't necessarily wish that on anyone, a long presentation from me, but uh, when in Rome. Uh, and so, so here goes. Um, so I started in on this project uh, a couple of years ago um, because as a, a former litigator, I was both fascinated and kind of annoyed uh, by a growing academic literature and debate. And that, that debate has a couple of, of features to it. Um, first off, whenever we talk about legal tech, there's a, a pretty significant obsession with the future of lawyers. And that has a almost a defensive quality to it. It's about you know, the future professional authority and even profitability of lawyers. It, it revolves around questions as to whether big law will survive. And so that was a clear theme of this literature. Uh, another clear theme is that it's, it's actually profoundly futurist in its orientation. So there's lots of talk of you know, robo judges and robo lawyers, and even this idea of, of legal singularity. Um, uh, the notion that at some point in the in the, in the future, um, you know, we might be able to perfectly predict the outcome of any legal case, um, you know, as it's filed, or perhaps even before it, uh, it, it it's it's filed. Um, and these are all really interesting ideas, but I felt like there was something missing, and there was uh, there was other types of thinking um, that could and and, and should um, be done. So the result of all of this, of course, is that um, we've got these ideas of robo judges and robo lawyers and legal singularity. And in fact, um, those all exist out at some kind of hazy horizon. So 
What annoyed me about the literature? Well, it was actually kind of bimodal at the end of the day. There's all this um, relatively narrow stuff on the future of the leveraged partner big law model or technology assisted review and in, discover, in discovery on the one hand, and then also all this talk out at this like hazy, very distant horizon um, with ideas like, like legal singularity. And I thought Ted Parsons, who's a, who's a very excellent uh, law professor at UCLA said it best. You know, He said on all things AI, there's this distribution of present attention and concern that is bimodal. To be a little glib, I'm quoting now directly from him, those whose disciplinary per perspectives make them most comfortable with speculative reasoning, often technical AI researchers and philosophers, are attracted to endpoint singularity related issues, which lend themselves to elegant analytically rich theoretical inquiries. Most other researchers, on the other hand, gravitate to current concerns and historical precedents because their disciplines frown on speculation and favor arguments based on observable data and evidence. These areas of inquiry are both valuable and important, yet they leave dis disturbingly empty the large middle ground of impacts and challenges lying between these endpoints where AI might transform people and societies while still remaining mostly under human control. So I started writing with that medium term gaze, that middle point gaze. And I now have a few papers in the law review pipeline um, that, um, that have started to, to explore some of those issues. And I've had lots of help along the way. I've had uh, the magnificent research assistants of Lindsey Franklin and Alex Evelson. I'm not sure if they're out there in the audience, but if they are, um, thank you. These are just really talented um, Stanford Law students who helped me think about all of this stuff. So, I've worked my way around to, to a thesis uh, with their help. And, um, and, and here it is. Um, it's that we need to direct our gaze that's neither inside the boat nor out at that hazy horizon. And once we do that, we can see that legal tech has the potential to reshape the legal system's adversarial architecture. And it's going to do that not necessarily by replacing humans with robo judges and robo, robo lawyers. Again, I think that's a long ways off but rather by shifting or even resetting some of our adversarial systems uh, procedural cornerstones. That's the first part of the thesis. The second part is that it's gonna be judges applying civil procedure rules who are gonna be the frontline regulators of legal tech as it is brought into the civil justice system and frankly, as it moves to the center of the civil justice system. And so that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. I wanna to talk to you about how legal tech has this capacity over the me very medium term, this is no longer a long-term horizon concern, um, that over the medium term, it has this capacity to reshape the basic adversarial structure of our legal system. And that's really important. And the way that's gonna happen is judges applying civil procedure rules in the mine run of cases as, um, as these legal tech tools um, are taken up and, and, and populate the civil justice system. All right, that's where we're at. So these are really big claims. And so we have to move really deliberately as we sketch them out. And so I'm gonna do a couple of things before we even really talk about civil procedure, um, because I think you first have to understand the landscape of legal tech. You also have to understand where the technology currently is and arrive at something like a sober assessment as to where it is, but also a very sober assessment about where it can go in the near to medium term. So let's start with the first uh, one of those, which is, you know, what is the current landscape of legal tech? This violates every maxim of good PowerPoint um, uh, presentation um, uh, approaches, um, and I'm sorry about that, but this is my effort to sort of slice and dice the legal tech industry. And lots of others have tried to do this and you can slice and dice legal tech in a bunch of ways. You can think about sales channel, channel or these legal tech tools, are they sold to lawyers or businesses or clients parties? You can think about the, the particular task that the legal tech tool does. Is it performing something we could call legal analytics? Is it, is it performing outcome prediction, trying to decide the outcomes of cases? Um, you know, is it performing contract analysis? These are all just examples of tasks that current legal tech tools perform. You can also think about the point in litigation time, the, the point in a litigation where the legal tech tool actually gets used. So is this a client development tool? Is it used in discovery? Is it used for, you know, legal research in the briefing of cases? Um, is it used at trial? 
Um, and finally, you can, you can divide uh, legal tech tools by whether they um, are used by lawyers uh, or rather whether they tend to be used by um, maybe folks without lawyers, so the unrepresented. So are these tools used within the confines of the litigation system by lawyers litigating cases within that system? Or are they, are they actually designed to be used outside the formal legal system in some way? All right, so that's the, so this is just my effort. Hopefully you've had a chance to, to take a look at it. That's my effort to, to slice and dice in my own way um uh you know all the different tools that are out there and it was just for my purposes to get an understanding of just the incredible diversity and variety of tools that are available out there so today we're going to focus almost entirely on tools legal tech tools that are used within the confines of the civil justice system by lawyers um and if and, and in fact we're, we're maybe even going to go a little more focused than that because we're really going to be thinking about tools of three different flavors so tools that are used in e-discovery so these are the technology assisted review or um, predictive coding tools um, and then moving from there tools that perform various types of legal analytics and then finally tools that um, perform that outcome prediction task that i mentioned previously i think those are kind of the big three and i think they're gonna they're gonna um you know motivate a lot of um what i talk about today so if that's what the landscape of legal tech looks like uh then i guess the really important question is like how fast and how far can these various tools advance like if, if i don't think that they're going to replace human lawyers anytime soon then what exactly are they going to do and here, I think it's important to note that there are a whole bunch of potential barriers to legal text advance. So for instance, legal ethical rules, like the unauthorized practice of law restrictions uh, that uh, virtually every state, maybe every state within the United States adopted, those are clearly gonna shape the development of tools, especially those tools that assist the unrepresented. Um, other things that are potential barriers to legal text advance, well, there's the fact that lawyers are inherently conservative. You know, we're all closet Burkeans at the end of the day, and we don't like math much. And so that is going to be a clear cultural barrier to the development of these tools. Um, there's also a lot of interesting barriers around the current structure of the legal services industry. The billable hour approach obviously doesn't lend itself very well to big client spanning technological investment. So it could be that big law isn't especially well outfitted to invest in and help develop legal tech tools. And relatedly to all of this, you have the legal ethical ban in the United States, at least on fee splitting and non-lawyer ownership of firms, which means that law firms actually have a lot of trouble cap tapping capital. And so again, this is all in the nature of identifying a few barriers that are likely to shape the evolution, evolution of, um, of legal tech over time. But my view is that the biggest barrier is going to be technical. And here it shouldn't be any surprise to any of you in the audience that the, that the game changing tools within legal tech uh, currently do involve and going forward will involve predictive analytics of various sorts and in particular machine learning. And in particular from there, natural language processing. And this of course is the branch of machine learning that does text analysis. So, why does it all seem to lead to NLP? As you see on the slide, it says all roads lead to NLP. Why is that? Well, because um, the legal system trades in words. Um, and so law, as one commentator put it, has, has language at its heart. And so given that the legal system trades in words, it seems clear that legal text development is gonna hinge quite uh, tightly on uh, the development of NLP. So the good news is that NLP is getting better and better in terms of its ability to do text analysis. Uh, many of those developments came right here at Stanford. So we've moved from relatively uh, naive expert systems to the slightly less naive bag of words approach and st st statistical approaches to NLP, which really are just built around word frequencies and some, and some math. Um, but since then, we've, we've moved to something far more powerful. And I think most people probably know this, but in case they don't, um, NLP has moved in a deep learning direction. And, uh, and in fact, what these tools do is they reduce words or parts or combos of words to vectors, so just very long strings of numbers. Uh, we call those embeddings, and then we manipulate them with billions of calculations. And so what's the state of the art currently? Well, it might be Google's BERT model, or um, actually OpenAI just announced the GPT-3 model. These are uh, what are called um, semi-supervised models uh, that do the contextual analysis necessary 
to create extremely powerful embeddings uh, for words to do that, to do that, um, you know, that to, to, to create vectors that can then be manipulated mathematically. So I don't have time to talk entirely, uh, to talk through all of, of NLP. Um, hopefully most of you are conversant with it or familiar with it. Um, um, but I will say this, which is there are still two kinds of problems with NLP when it comes to legal analysis. Um, the first is that most advanced NLP engines, no matter how advanced they are, they still can't read. NLP experts call this discourse level analysis and law is especially tricky in that regard. And the reason is that legal reasoning consists of a dizzying array of analytic moves. Case outcomes often turn on a, on a dense mix of rule-based reasoning and case-based reasoning, including linguistic arguments about a statutory or a regulatory terms ordinary meaning, systemic arguments about harmonization across statutory sections, analogical arguments from past case law, evidentiary arguments about key facts, and teleological arguments from legislative purposes or other substantive values. So not only must the machine identify and manipulate different types of legal argument, again, the linguistic, the systemic, the analogical, the evidentiary, the teleological, it must also develop traffic rules for navigating between them, okay? So NLP has surely advanced quite a bit in parsing legal argument. It can currently identify the rhetorical roles played by different sentences and opinions and who among the possible speakers, is this a judge talking, a litigant talking, a, a testifying expert, is this an evidentiary document? Who among the possible speakers is making an assertion? But what is clear is that NLP has not yet made the leap from these simpler tasks to full on argument mining. So that is the, the automated discovery of deep discourse structure and argument related information, including propositions, premises, conclusions, and exceptions. In really concrete terms, NLP can't create ontologies. That is knowledge representations of an area of doctrine. It certainly can't do it on its own. And this is some of uh, the really amazing work that, that Julian Yarko is doing. He's one of my new colleagues at Stanford Law School. I think he's really interested in this question of where NLP can go in that regard, but it's clear that NLP is not there currently. Instead, and for the moment, and maybe into the in for the foreseeable future, into the into the near to medium term, even the most cutting edge legal analytics tools require lawyers to perform two critical and resource intensive tasks. They have to translate a doctrinal test into a structure, maybe a structure of hierarchical elements, and then. Lawyers have to annotate legal texts in order to be able to train machines to find those elements in other texts. Now, if you have lawyers to do those things, um, uh, it's, it's a very lawyer intensive process, but the results can be very powerful. So fed well-labeled data machine learning tool can determine that factor X or maybe a, a, a case that many thought was the most important case within a, a precedential web, um, that, that those, those factors or that case um, has become or maybe always was irrelevant. And that's a powerful finding once you, once you do the work to get there. But the process of getting there is still very much human and lawyer centered. Okay, so that's the first challenge. That's the, that's the discourse challenge. Um, but here's the second challenge, which is that machines can't perform or mimic wider legal cognitions. Uh, yet to form something we could call legal judgment. Now, lawyers in the audience will know there's no single way to capture what lawyers do, uh, but a rough approximation is that sound legal judgment has to be both synoptic and subtle. So what do I mean by synoptic? In order to really judge a case, to think about the probability of your client winning the case, you have to marry an internal and an external perspective. Okay, and that's what I mean by synoptics. So what does internal mean? Well, that's kind of law and doctrine on its own terms within the four corners of, um, of, uh, you know, of, 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 the, of the doctrine that, that, that controls a particular case. External perspective could be a lot of things though. It could be the docket loads, the legal real sense, what the judge had for breakfast, the ideological predilections of jurors in a particular jurisdiction or forum. 
Um, but the point is that you have to actually marry both of those in order to make a good judgment as to one's prospects for winning a case, for instance. And that's, that's the essence of lawyer judgment there. It's being able to marry those two together in making that prediction. Okay, so that's the synoptic part. The subtle part is that uh, in order to exercise something we could call legal judgment, you have to be able to anticipate changes. You have to be, to be able to anticipate changes in social norms, changes in those teleological rationales, the kind of ends of justice type ideas, um, or even like the, the morality of law as, as, as Lon Fuller talked about. These are the kind of the in interstitial values that drive law in between um, doctrinal concepts. All right, so, so synoptic and subtle machines might or or some uh, might be or maybe someday will be quite good at the former. In fact, you know, corralling a bunch of internal and external factors and weighting them properly might be exactly what machines are especially good at when it comes to um, exercising legal judgment. But the latter, the subtle part of it, is actually really hard. Um, uh, and 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 the reason is that. Um, you know, that, that, uh, that changes uh, can actually be very hard to anticipate. Um, and, and the result is that like law is a very dynamic thing. And it means that weighting both the internal and the external determinants of a case is more than just a brute force analytic exercise. It's actually a very subtle, trend sensitive, predictive one. So a pair of conclusions I think follows from all of this. Um, one is that it, it seems clear if we try to we really focus in on, on NLP and its, and its um, current uh, trajectory, it does seem like the quickest advances in NLP are going to happen in very narrow, siloed, technocratic, self-contained areas. And if you, if, you, if you see where, if you look where legal tech has made the most progress to this point um, in say predicting case outcomes, it's come in these narrow technocratic self-contained areas. It's come in the tax context or the employment context or the domestic relations context, especially divorce or the, the housing, the landlord tenant context. It's also happened quite a bit in the administrative context where administrative agencies are um, you know, say doing adjudications of eligibility for disability benefits. And by the way, this connects to some of the other work I've been doing, thinking about government agency use of AI, including in the adjudication space. So that's that's one aspect of the road ahead, I think, for NLP. And one of the conclusions that I think follow from soberly examining the current state of NLP. But here's here's the second, which is that it seems clear to me, at least, that over the near to medium term, even the most advanced legal tech tools are going to involve a substantial amount of lawyer engagement. So rather than full automation, Legal and tech is instead going to yield a kind of what you could call advanced lawyering. And this is a, this is this, a spin on, on this, uh, uh, it's actually chess master Gary Kasparov. He has this notion of advanced chess in which human and machine ally and compete against other human machine teams. So working symbiotically rather than merely pitting human against machine. And so I do think that going forward, the, 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 the most potent legal tech tools are gonna have that advanced lawyering aspect to them. And it's actually going to be, um, you know, human and machine working symbiotically. Okay, so that's the first part of what we need to do. We have to understand where NLP is currently um, and where we, th and, and, and again, in a sober way, where can it go over the near to medium term? And so that was my effort to, to, to capture that. Okay, so maybe I got that right. Maybe I maybe I didn't. Maybe at Q and A, I'll be told that I've um, I've I've misconceived the current state of um, uh, of NLP. But suppose I did get it right. Um, you know, once we know all of this, once we have that sober assessment of where NLP is, I think that helps us then to begin to think in more concrete ways about legal text medium term implications. And so let's move to that. We'll call it the trouble with, with legal tech. So I, I see three of those medium term implications, or at least when I think about it, I, I kind of think in terms of three buckets of near to medium term implications. So one is the implications of, um, of legal tech for lawyers and the legal profession. Um, and um, it's, it's pretty clear that legal tech will change lawyering and the legal services industry over the near to medium term, but there's a whole lot of contingency there. So on the one hand, there are plenty of people who say that 
legal tech is going to uh, be a force multiplier for smaller law firms. It's going to level the playing field by allowing smaller firms to compete with what were previously heavily leveraged big law firms. That's certainly possible, I suppose. Um, but and, and, and there are plenty who have therefore predicted the death of big law. Um, but it's also just as possible when you really, I think, read deeply into the literature that um, legal tech is just going to create a new profit center uh, for big law. And, and if, you look at, um, if you look across the landscape of big law, you can see that big law firms are already developing their own proprietary tools. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but they also have privileged access to data. They have the resources to build internal technical capacity. And so again, the possibility, it's possible that far from leveling the playing field within the legal services industry, the reality is that, that, that legal tech simply provides a new profit center uh, for big law. So I don't know which that's going to be, but um, I think that a, a more certain prediction as to where legal tech is going to go is that legal tech will result in a process of lawyer de-skilling and de-centering. De -centering. So what do I mean by de-skilling? Well, the presence of legal tech tools is going to create fewer opportunities and fewer incentives for lawyers to uh, invest in particular skill sets. And so some people worry about a, an epistemic sclerosis within the legal profession as more and more legal, legal tasks, including some higher order ones, are, um, are performed by machines. Um, also, decentering, what do I mean by that? I think uh, just really concretely, the easiest way to see that is in the technology assisted review context, in the e discovery context. And so I'm going to talk about this a little bit once we turn to some of the civil procedure implications. Um, but the, 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 the most concrete version of this is that going forward in big complex litigations, discovery disputes will no longer be motions practice between lawyers, um, but rather will at least in part be. Um, duels between technologists on either side, um, talking about the machine learning methods that were used um, to perform the, the search and the, and the flagging of documents for relevance and privilege. And, and that's really important when we think about lawyers and the legal profession, um, because that means that there's going to be a, a certain amount of leakage of professional status and authority that is occasioned by legal tech. All right, so that's the first broad implication of all of this. Um, uh, uh, the second is uh, the, the, the possible rule of law implications here. Um, and um, uh, there's a whole lot of really interesting writing on this. I, I kind of made light of it at the beginning of my presentation. Um, it, it has attracted some very smart philosophy of law types uh, who think about jurisprudence. It takes us from Holmes to Hayek to HLA, Hart, and back again. Um, uh, by the way, if, if you want a really great and accessible romp through the reasons why should we why we should be worried about legal tech or its or its effects on on rule of law, then I would recommend to you a paper by Richard Ray and Alicia Sodal Niederman in the Stanford Law and Technology Review. Um, you know they argue that that uh, legal tech tools, especially out, outcome prediction tools, uh, are going to push us toward codified justice rather than equitable justice, and that means we're going to lose key equitable values like mercy or extenuation. Um, from the law. We're also going to progressively drain the system of its flexibility, its adaptive capacity, its dialogic core. Um, maybe worse of all, they say that the system is going to be self-legitimating because datafication will center and foreground values linked to available data um, that are themselves conducive to further automation. So you can call these process-based uh, concerns, the process by which the law is made, and the way that legal tech is actually going to reshape maybe our conceptions of law itself. I don't know about all that. That feels a little above my pay grade. I'm not a jurisprudence person, um, but I'm attracted to a second way of thinking about uh, legal tech's effect on rule of law, which is not process-based, but personnel-based. And this takes us back to de-skilling and de-centering, which is that if you think lawyers are bulwarks, uh, of rule of law within legal systems, then if we in some sort of creeping way replace them with technologists who lack uh, a sense of legal ethical duty to client court and the public, then we certainly lose some of that bulwark role. Okay, those are just two ideas then about uh, the trouble with legal tech and some of its implications. I wanna focus on a third one that I think is um, actually in, in, in some ways a lot more important. It hits closer to the concerns that animate the federal rules of civil procedure, for instance, and therefore I think it takes us closer to some of my thinking about how legal tech is going to require adaptations of some of our procedural 
rules. And this is the distributive puzzle. This is the distributive impacts of legal tech. And, and when I say distributive, I of course mean the, the who gets what, when, and how. Uh, that's a common formulation in political science. Uh, or um, in Mark Galanter, the law professor at UCLA, his more litigation specific formulation, which is whether and how the haves come out ahead of the have nots within the litigation system. Now, as I already noted, there are lots of optimistic possibilities here when we think about legal tech's implications for the legal system. You know, it could be that legal tech is a great leveler um, uh, because it allows those smaller firms to square off and do battle with, with bigger, bigger firms. That's possible. It could also make legal services cheaper. And this could have a really profound effect. The amount of representation, legal representation on offer within a system is always gonna be endogenous to its cost. If, if, if legal services cost less, then people will consume more of it. And so you could maybe imagine legal tech bringing about a, a golden age of litigation so that the people law sector, this is the part of, um, of the legal system that serves individuals rather than uh, entities. And in fact, uh, often large entities. You can imagine people law could rebound those are all possibilities. I think that's probably overly optimistic because um, in, in my opinion, it's actually far easier to, to, to paint a, a much darker portrait of the effect that legal tech is gonna have as a distributive matter over that near to medium term period. And there are a bunch of things up on the slide that, that um, show you why I think that's the case. I think all of these factors are gonna converge potentially um, to create this distributive problem. So, you know, what, what, let, let's just step through a couple of them. Um, first of all, with, with NLP's current limits and the fact that it's actually quite, quite resource intense, intensive uh, and lawyer intensive to create um, potent legal tech tools, that's clearly gonna benefit entities with, um, with uh, resources, with that technical capacity, with the lawyers to throw at a problem. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, you know, firm structure and lawyer regulation can matter a lot. Um, you know, in this, in the United States, um, we're uh, a couple of states and, and soon I think more um, have relaxed those rules on fee splitting and non-lawyer ownership of firms. And that's clearly gonna improve the innovation ecosystem because it's gonna allow capital to flow into law firms, uh, many of whom are, are, are um, you know, are, are developing these tools but it's clear that that capital is gonna flow into entities that already have something of a corporate bent. And so that's a little concerning. IP protections are gonna matter here. Um, and depending on how um, rigorously those are enforced, that can obviously have a really important distributive effect. Um, but let's focus on the final two. I think these are the really important ones as we think about legal tax implications as a distributive matter. Um, one just super important is data accessibility. Um, uh, so Charlotte Alexander, she's a professor at Georgia Tech, she recently wrote that um, a lot of the court data that one needs to develop potent legal tech tools sit behind walls of cash and kludge, as she put it, which is to say they sit behind paywalls. Um, so in order to, to download documents from PACER, you have to pay on a, on a per page basis, and those costs can mount very, very quickly. But PACER is also a, a wall of kludge. Uh, it's a terrible interface, it's very hard. In fact, it's, it's not allowed to do bulk download of data. And so this is worrying uh, and data accessibility is worrying because what it means is that um, only large entities, so large tech companies um, or large law firms are gonna have the resources and the ability to get the kind of bulk data that they need in order to develop legal tech tools. And so you can think of it as the litigation haves have privileged access to the data they need to make useful um, and potent tools. All right, last one then is all the usual litigation dynamics um, that we talk about when we think about the, the distributive contours of, of a litigation system. We all know that repeat play, or sorry, repeat players within litigation um, uh, regimes, they tend to win out over the, the one-shotters. Among other things, they can play for rules and only litigate the cases uh, that might ultimately produce law that benefits them. They can engage in form shopping. Um, repeat players also have all kinds of advantages uh, at the settlement uh, table. And so um, I think all of this is coming to roost. All of these factors are coming to roost in a very specific area right now that I think is actually quite illustrative, uh, which is you have a um, a set of collaborations between law firms, among them um, Ogletree Deacons, um, and companies, among them Walmart, uh, and legal tech companies, among them Legal Mation. And those three in particular 
are, are driving forward a set of legal tech tools that I think have really significant distributive implications. Um, and what they're doing is they're able to make fairly good predictions as to case outcomes in, uh, in uh, recurring areas that Walmart faces all the time. So these are high volume areas of litigation for them, employment um, and personal injury, especially uh, slip and falls. And they have developed a set of tools that both include, a, I think, a prediction about the likely outcome of the case, but that can also in an automated way generate um, pleadings and papers. So can, can, can generate an answer um, in, a, in, a, in a lawsuit. Um, and can also uh, generate uh, some initial discovery requests uh, in a lawsuit. And so that's, that's really concerning because that suggests that uh, legal tech really is gonna be the sort of thing that favors litigations have uh, rather than litigations have, uh, have nots. And so when I think at least about uh, the effect that legal tech is gonna have on the civil justice system, I always focus in quite a bit on, on that example. Okay, so that's a lot. So far, I've given you an understanding of the full landscape of legal tech, at least as I currently see it. Um, we've talked a little bit about what the technical frontier is, like what maybe some of the constraints are on NLP over the near to medium term. And then I've talked quite widely about different implications for lawyers and the legal services industry, for rule of law, and, uh, and for distributive concerns. Um, so that it was long winded, but I think it's really important because I think it helps us to lay a foundation for more concrete thinking when we move to thinking about how, say, the civil procedure rules are going to modulate the uptake of legal tech over that near to medium term. So let's turn to that. Let's do three case studies. Um, uh, of ways that I think all of this really interesting um, uh, innovation around legal tech. Um, uh, is, is going to press on, on very specific civil procedure rules. So three case studies, here's, here's the first one. It's technology assisted review. So that is also sometimes known as predictive coding. It's the, it's the e-discovery tools um, that I'll explain in just a moment. Um, and then in particular, the relationship then of TAR to proportionality rules within discovery and also uh, plausibility pleading. And I will explain what all of that is. I think it's a nice place to, to start, by the way. So what is technology assistant review? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a set of machine learning based tools usually uh, that are used to flag documents for relevance and privilege in civil litigation. And uh, this is a really important set of tools uh, because you increasingly have very large document productions, millions of documents. And so if you can flag them for relevance and privilege um, in an automated way, it's a, it's a massive uh, cost savings. So, TAR though is already generating substantial litigation and here's, here's how. Um, recall that, um, well, maybe not recall, but you, you, you should know that TAR is actually a kind of su supervised learning within machine learning, which means that lawyers actually have to manually flag a subset of documents as relevant or not or privileged or not. And then the machine learning system mimics those flags in new and unlabeled data. Okay, but the result of that process of supervised learning is something called a seed set, which is just a bunch of lawyer flagged, so manually flagged documents. Now, one of the key questions that's arising in litigation as TAR has come into the civil justice system is whether one side in a litigation can demand the seed set from the other side. So one argument is that the, not all of the seed set is relevant under uh, federal rule of civil procedure 26B1 because the documents in the seed set that are labeled as non-relevant, they, uh, they don't actually come within the rules and so they need not be produced. And so one of the questions that judges are struggling with is should, should they, can they, can a judge nonetheless compel the sharing of a seed set to test the comprehensiveness of, of a discovery effort if some of that seed set includes documents that aren't relevant. Another argument is work product. So there's a case, the leading case is a third circuit case called Spork. It says that you don't have to turn over lists of hot documents, say, that you use to prepare a deponent um, for a, a deposition because it would reveal attorney mental impressions about key issues in a case and also the litigation strategy. And so the question that judges are having to think hard about right now, and there's already a few published opinions on it, are, are, are seed sets the same as those lists of, head, of, of hot docs? Do they in some way reveal information about litigation strategy or attorney mental impressions that would normally be protected under something called the work product? 
doctrine. Now I'll come back to that in a minute, um, but for now, I think this is really our first opportunity to see then how legal tech has the potential to shape uh, and to shift the basic terms of the adversarial system. So on the one hand, judges might apply relevant, re relevance or work product to defeat cooperation between parties. And so the result could be a situation in which the haves who have better technologists or who are more likely to use tar in the first place can lord over the have nots. And the have nots have very few ways to challenge the comprehensiveness of a, um, of a, of a, of a production. So on the other hand, if tar becomes pervasive, which I think will depend at least in part on uh, judicial receptivity to it, it has the potential to impact some really longstanding debates in civil procedure. And the reason is that much rulemaking over the past several decades has been preoccupied and even obsessed with this idea of litigation costs, um, both absolute litigation costs, the total cost of a litigation, but also the asymmetric litigation costs. And this is the, the fact that often plaintiffs in a suit can externalize a whole bunch of discovery costs onto defendants in a way that can produce, um, well, that creates settlement leverage. So one way we've tried to mitigate that is through proportionality rules. So rule 26B1 at the federal level now requires a judge to consider whether a discovery request is proportional to the needs of the case, considering a whole bunch of factors, including the importance of the issues, um, you know, the likely benefit of having the discovery, et cetera. So here's my prediction, which is as TAR comes into the legal system, it will, uh, I think that these concerns about proportionality will fall away as discovery costs steadily decline. And that will be a huge and important tectonic shift in how we think about discovery. There's another sleeper issue in here, which is that more efficient discovery brought about by TAR um, could well steadily undermine the case for plausibility pleading. So this is a case called Twombly. And for lawyers in the, in the audience, um, you, know, you know that that was a case that was um, concerned above all with, this, with, um, with asymmetric litigation costs. The concern was, you know, we need to give judges more ways to dismiss cases right at the outset of litigation, precisely because of the ability of plaintiffs, often plaintiffs, to impose discovery costs on defendants. It's actually had an enormous impact, some say, within the litigation system, especially for civil rights cases, certain types of cases where there are very strong information asymmetries, where the plaintiffs don't actually know whether they have a good claim or can't get access to the discovery that they might need. Um, to know whether they have a good claim without first suing and getting access to civil discovery. And so this is another place where I think legal tech could have a really important impact on a, on a really core foundational uh, civil procedure rule. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump ahead to the third case study. I'm gonna skip the second case study, um, uh, which is about form shopping and the ways that legal tech tools might actually promote form shopping. And instead, I'm going to turn to um, more directly to this idea of um, uh, to, to this idea of well to, to to work product, which is the 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 rule that I already started to talk about. Uh, and here's where I think uh, there's the greatest potential for a really significant shift in the adversarial structure of of the American at least uh, legal system. So I already touched on this in the tar context, um, but now let's now let's hit it uh, head on. Um, because the bigger question that I think sitting atop the development um, of legal tech tools and their um, proliferation throughout the civil justice system is the degree to which we might want to protect legal tech outputs from discovery requests or instead compel their sharing among litigants. And so the really concrete example is, say you're litigating a case against Walmart and you know that Walmart has extremely potent tool that can predict uh, with some degree of confidence um, the likelihood that Walmart wins the, the suit. Um, and they also are engaged in other things too. I noted that they could be developing um, uh, pleadings uh, that way. Um, but the question is, as a plaintiff, do you can you uh, request in discovery whatever, um, whatever Walmart's data-based assessment of its litigation prospects are? And my view is that judges are going to field more and more of these requests over time, especially if we reach a world in that medium term timeframe where 
the litigation's haves or the haves of the litigation world actually have a fairly potent set of tools and the have nots do not. So what do I mean by that? Let's talk a little bit about the work product doctrine. It, um, it came into being, at least in the United States in 1947 in a case called Hickman. And Hickman said that we need to protect uh, the work that lawyers do privately, privately to prepare cases. And we need to create a zone of privacy around what lawyers do, okay? Um, and here's some great language from uh, Robert Jackson. He was the Supreme Court justice who wrote a very important concurrence in that case. He said, look, a common law trial is and always should be an adversary proceeding. Discovery was hardly intended to enable a learned profession to perform its functions, either without wits or wits borrowed from the adversary. So part of that is the zone of privacy idea. Hopefully you can see that in that quote and they talk about it elsewhere in the opinion quite explicitly as well. But a really important part of Hickman is maintaining the conditions necessary for healthy adversarial system, okay? And the reason and the way Hickman does that is, and the idea I think is that you have to make good lawyering valuable for people to invest in it. That is to say good lawyering has to matter. It has to matter to outcomes or we won't have much good lawyering. So good lawyering will be get good lawyering because people will invest in it. The way you get good lawyering is you protect the work of good lawyering and prevent the other side from simply free riding on the good lawyering of the other side. And so this is this idea of borrowed wits. We should not allow one side to borrow the wits of the other side, okay? Now, but this unfortunately requires us to bracket distributive concerns. So the American adversarial system is built around this idea. We can't possibly allow borrowed wits. Um, and yet we bracket the distributive concern, which is that some people can afford better lawyers than others, okay? So we've always bracketed that. And so the big question to my mind over the medium term is gonna be whether we want to relax the work product rule and whether we will reach a point where the, the litigation haves have such potent technological tools and are so able to systematically win out over litigation's have-nots that we might wanna rethink that bracketing of that distributive concern. And so you can see in the, the title of the slide, um, you know, the, the basic question is, you know, do we think we want to protect borrowed bits? So legal tech machine outputs the same way that we have for decades uh, protected borrowed wits. And again, I said it already, but I think that judges are increasingly going to field requests. Some of those will be in the nature of seed sets within technology assisted review and e-discovery. But my view is that as legal tech tools get better and better and are used um, more and more systematically within the system, the judges are going to feel more and more requests in that regard. So it's a really interesting question then as to whether work product um, protects legal tech outputs. Um, and so, uh, you know, in the, so, so and, and that takes us a little bit into some of the minutia of the rule. So um, for instance, uh, under the current rules of civil procedure, work product that can be called uh, opinion work product, that is to say, uh, represents the mental impressions of an attorney about legal strategy is given near absolute protection. protection. But something called fact work product that doesn't necessarily um, memorialize the mental impressions of an attorney, um, it gets only qualified protection. And, and, and there you can actually um, uh, overcome the presumption that something is protected by work product if you can show a substantial need for it or for undue, uh, and, and if you can show undue hardship. Now, the question then, the threshold question then is, okay, so would we consider a legal tech output an outcome prediction by a Walmart in a litigation? Would we consider that opinion work product or fact work product? And I think there's a really good argument that a legal tech tool, an outcome prediction tool in particular is fact work product. And the reason is that um, a lot of the work of developing that tool happens way upstream. It's the development of those ontologies. It's, the, it's that lawyer driven process of putting a hierarchical structure structure on the doctrinal area. And it's not necessarily work that's done in the context of any particular litigation. And so, um, and, and indeed in the particular litigation, uh, the use of the tool is largely a keystroke. It might be it's the, it's the entry of some case details. Um, it might be a, in, in a really fully automated world, the entry of a, of a complaint into the system. 
um, that then generates uh, the prediction as to the, the likely outcome of the case. But the point is the actual amount of attorney um, effort might be quite low. And so as a threshold matter, it could be that we think of legal tech outputs as simply being fact work product, not opinion work product. If that's true, then we turn to the question of whether there's substantial need, whether it would impose undue hardship. Um, and here there's lots of lawyering to be done. And I think judges are really gonna struggle with that. So for instance, undue hardship, um, it, it, would, it, would it be very difficult for uh, the party requesting the discovery uh, to actually redo the analysis? Well, certainly yes, especially if what we're talking about is a world in which the large entities, whether those are tech companies uh, or big law firms, if they have privileged access to both the data they need to operate the tool, um, but also uh, perhaps even the internal technical capacity that they need to perform the analytics, then the answer to that question might be a, a decided yes. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a flavor for where I think some of those ground level frontline civil procedure debates will go. Uh, and, and, and I really do think that this is something um, that's going to um, feature increasingly in civil litigation, especially as more and more of these legal tech tools come into the system and indeed move to the center of the civil justice system. And if you think about it, then the challenge for courts and maybe in time for rule makers, the people who make the, the advisory committees, for instance, who actually make the civil procedure rules, and maybe even eventually legislators will be, how do we balance all of these concerns and how do we do so under a set of procedural rules that were crafted and elaborated in a very different analog era? And so once again, this, this tees up this idea that maybe we would want to treat borrowed bits differently from borrowed wits. Um, as, as legal tech tools advance in their efficacy and potency. Okay, one last slide. Um, and then I hope to move to, to Q&A and get some of your impressions of all of this, um, which is suppose we were going to um, uh, uh, entertain some thinking at the level of the folks that I mentioned and even made a little bit of light of at the outset of the, the talk. So what if, what if we were to, to, to think about some of the wider aperture implications of all of this? What would, that, what would that look like? And here are just a couple of thoughts that might help prime some conversation or might be interesting um, to, to you all. Um, the first is that I think over the medium term, so maybe over the next 10 years, um, I think we're going to see the development of an IP, like an intellectual property for civil procedure. Sometimes that's going to be a direct link to intellectual property. We're going to have to decide the degree to which intellectual property protections attach to certain legal tech tools. But I think there's actually a less direct connection that, actually, that ultimately is going to be more important, which is that judges who are thinking about how to apply the civil procedure rules to legal tech tools are going to be presiding over what amounts to an innovation policy. And their decisions are really gonna help shape the legal tech industry. And, and it's gonna happen for a very particular reason, which is when we think about things like work product doctrine, or when we think about the shareability of seed sets, well, that's going to impact the, um, the value of the tools in the hands of any particular litigant. And the reason is that a lot of these legal tech tools, they actually derive their value from exclusivity. They're most valuable to a litigant when that litigant has the legal tech tool and all the informational advantages it confers, but their, um, their opponent, uh, their adversary does not. And so the idea is the degree to which the, the judges applying the civil procedure rules um, are eroding that or either upholding or eroding that exclusivity is gonna have an important uh, impact on the value of those tools and therefore upstream on, on a legal tech industry that's willing to produce those tools. Ultimately, I think judges are gonna to have to think then about innovation incentives as they make civil procedure decisions. And that's very different from what judges normally do within civil procedure. Civil procedure for a long time has revolved around a bunch of very conventional procedural values, efficiency, accuracy, and fairness. And what makes the, the legal tech challenge really interesting, I think, is that judges are gonna to have to start thinking at least in part about civil procedure as a kind of innovation tech, uh, sorry, as a kind of innovation policy as these tools come into the system. So second really wide aperture implication of all of this is that I think you can 
think about four futures potentially of American adversarialism, again, over that medium term, maybe over the next 10 years. And it'll be really interesting to see which of these um, you know, quadrants um, uh, proves to be the case. So what, what am I talking about with these quadrants? Well, you know, everything we've been talking about to this point is really different types of information asymmetries created by legal text. So information asymmetries as between litigants, um, we can also think about information asymmetries, by the way, between uh, judge and litigant. And so that's where I get the four futures here. So let's let's just it's a it's a standard kind of two by two matrix then of um, of all the different possibilities. So let's start in the northwest quadrant. So this is like fully democratized legal tech. Like suppose legal tech is in the hands of all litigants and judges. Everyone has access to algorithmic outputs um, that can predict case outcomes that can maybe even litigate cases in some sort of automated way. Um, this seems good. Um, it seems good that there's full and equal information among all the different players, all the different stakeholders within litigation. But note what we lose. We certainly lose some of the dialogic value of law. Um, one of the great things about law is that cases get litigated in public deliberative exercises. And so if everything is done algorithmically, you can imagine there's gonna be an enormous amount of settlement behavior um, and, and not very much litigation that would give us that kind of dialogic deliberative benefit. Still, that Northwest quadrant might be a kind of ideal baseline as we think about some of the others. So let's switch to the Northeast quadrant. Like what if legal tech is in the hands of litigants equally? Uh, most litigants or all litigants have access to legal tech, but judges don't. This also seems good. There's still some issues here. We certainly lose some of the dialogic value of law and some of that deliberative um, piece um, of litigation that might worry us a bit. Um, uh, and um, we would also maybe worry about something different, which is that you know judges have gotten very managerial within the American system. They tend to insert themselves in the litigation a lot more than they did um, you know, earlier in the life of American law. And so if, if the litigants have access to a bunch of legal tech tools and have access to a lot of algorithmic outputs, um, we would probably want judges to stand down. We might, become we might become more worried about a kind of interventionist judicial role. And I think that's worth thinking about. All right, just to fill out the quadrants, what if we're down in that Southwest quadrant? I call this power sharing by judges and litigant halves. So this means um, uh, concentration of information in the hands of litigation's halves, but maybe also judges have tech too. And this would be, this would be uh, I'm not sure how likely this is, but, but it could be that legal tech is fairly unevenly distributed among litigants, but um, court systems are willing to invest in these tools that can say algorithmically predict case outcomes. Um, you know, this is not so good. You're going to create some very significant information asymmetries across litigants, and that means the haves are going to systematically win out over the have-nots. But all is not lost because at least if judges have some of those legal tech outputs and access to some of those tools, you know, perhaps they can play a, a mitigating role um, in terms of narrowing those asymmetries or at least preventing litigation's haves from uh, lording over litigation's have-nots. Last one. Southeast, um, Southeast quadrant, this is the litigation dystopia. I call this unilateral litigant supremacy. Like what if legal tech evolves in the medium term, again, say over the next 10 years or so, such that um, access to potent legal tech tools are concentrated in the hands of the haves of the litigation system, but no one else. So that includes the have-nots of the litigation system, but also judges. And so this is kind of a, a litigation dystopia um, in which um, we really have quite significant distributive concerns uh, within the system and in which legal tech, I think we could all agree, probably be a force for bad, assuming we can all agree on, a, on a, as, a, as a first principle matter, um, that there should be sort of a quality of arms within, within a litigation system. So I think I'm gonna stop there, but as I leave off, maybe to perhaps prime some discussion, um, you know, I'll leave off with just a couple of ideas on what we need to do, need to, do to avoid the less savory versions of this, or um, alternatively to, to avoid some of the concerns that I outlined earlier in my talk. Um, one is we clearly need to educate judges better. Um, if they're going to be the frontline regulators of legal tech, and again, if, it, if, if I'm right that legal tech, it, that its principal regulation is going to come from line level trial judges applying the rules of civil procedure, uh, then we need to educate them better. They need to understand these tools better, understand some of their implications, understand how they're 
actual, actually used. Um, second broad thing to think about, maybe to prime discussion, um, you know, we need to think hard about, uh, about data accessibility. Uh, and there is this brewing open court data movement uh, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and I think it's a really powerful idea that access to data really is going to be access to justice going forward, um, precisely because without access to data, we have that privileged access among certain players who will always have the ability to acquire needed data. Um, and that's going to create these distributive concerns. Um, one last thing, I think it's super helpful. I, I can't, I can't uh, miss the opportunity to say this, which is we need entrepreneurs in the legal tech space who are thinking about litigations have nots. Um, and, um, and I think that's going to be really important. Um, and, uh, and I hope that there are enough public spirited uh, technologists out there uh, to continue to produce legal tech tools that are, that are specifically focused on the have nots of the litigation world. Okay, that was a um, romp through a whole bunch of ideas that I've had as I have worked my way into this really interesting world of legal tech and as a, a litigator and as a civil procedure expert tried to think a little bit about what some of those medium term implications are going to be. And so I think we have just enough time now for some questions and so I would just be absolutely delighted uh, to field some of those questions and, and to get some of your impressions of all of this. So thank you and thanks again for having me. David, thank you. Thank you for your fascinating talk and for sharing your unique insights. It's been really uh, very, very good. Um, folks have a lot of questions already. So uh, Nader, um, and let's start with Nader. He says, excellent presentation uh, based on what's been discussed. Would there be a good reason to assume that AI driven legal analysis and judgment uh, would inherently favor a type of legal interpretation name, namely textualism over other types? I think the answer to that question is yes. Now, I already said halfway through my presentation that thinking about um, jurisprudential matters and legal tech is above my pay grade. Um, and, and remember, I, I recommended a, a particular pair of authors take on all of this. The literature is really vast and interesting, but I really like the Richard Ray, Alicia Sodal uh, Niederman paper because they talk about this distinction between codified justice and equitable justice. And so, um, or codified justice, I guess. Um, and so I guess Nader's question is, is asking, okay, so is this likely as a jurisprudential matter, that is to say the uptake of legal tech tools within the civil justice, and is that likely to push us in a, in a textualist direction? And I think the answer is yes, because uh, if, if, if Ray and Sodal Niederman are right, then codified justice is gonna focus on things we can quantify, it's gonna focus on text, and what's gonna get lost are those interstitial values, and in particular, those like teleological concepts within law. And so I think that really will then bring us towards textualism. That is the, it's not really, I guess it is quantifiable under NLP because that's what NLP does. Um, but I, I think the answer is yes, because NLP is going to steer us towards things we can quantify. Um, you know, the reduction of words in case law or in a statute to embeddings um, and then the manipulation of them through math, often again, billions of calculations. And, and, and what maybe gets lost are those interstitial values or, or maybe interstitial isn't even the right word. Maybe it's covering values, right? The big questions about the ends of justice that get lost in that. Um, so I think, I think the answer is yes, but you know, time will tell. Maybe there are technologists out there who will say, there's no reason why uh, sufficiently you know, smart um, uh, you know, aut automated tools can't take account of those teleological values. That, that's totally possible. And so maybe the reality is that there's like a temporal component to this. Maybe in the near to medium term, legal tech tools are laser focused on text, things that are quantifiable, but that as the technology develops, it actually develops a facility and a capacity to deal and to trade in bigger think, um, you know, values that we normally think of as kind of inherent to human judging, at least right now. So that's a great question. Thank you, Nader. So Gustavo is uh, saying congratulations for the for the lecture, and he's wondering whether uh, big law will lose its importance as in-house legal departments could use uh, uh, new expert systems and create alternative uh, uh, multi multi-door ODR solutions based on their demands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think there's something to that. That's something that I've written about. It's certainly in, in some of the papers that I have going in this space, which is um, 
uh, it's clear that legal tech is going to impact um, the distribution of work as between um, in-house counsel and outside counsel. Um, and in fact, many of you probably know in the audience that there was already a move towards uh, what's sometimes called insourcing, where um, you know, in in-house counsel departments have grown somewhat, um, and they're in terms of the, you know, it's kind of theory of the firm, right? If you're if you're a company, you have to figure out how much legal representation you want to make and how much you want to buy. And so, I think the trend was already in the direction of make, um, but it could be that legal tech actually accelerates that uh, to some extent. Um, I. You know, I don't, I don't, uh, all these things are just predictions. I guess I would love to recommend another reading, um, which I have just found to be a really astute and, um, and rigorous accounting of firm structure and legal tech. And it's a paper by John Armour and by um, Mari Suko, I think, at Oxford. Um, so this is a law school professor and a business school professor. And so if you if you look them up, John Armour and uh, it's, I think it's Seiko, S-A-K-O. If you look that up, it's, it's a really interesting accounting then of how firm structure has changed since, um, you know, since in the UK, they actually deregulated the legal services industry in a really significant way. And they talk about insourcing, among other things, um, and 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 really do a, a thorough treatment then of how lawyer level regulation can shape the innovation innovation ecosystem. And so, you know, if you're interested in what the future of in-house counsel is given legal tech, um, then I think um, the the Armour Seiko piece gives you you know, kind of even broader sense of that landscape while also maybe addressing some of the more you know specific in-house counsel aspects of it. Thank you. So, um, uh, Mark's uh, referring to your point about uh, some of those regulatory sandbox projects that are going on, uh, saying that Utah has a pilot project on the way to measure the impact of allowing non lawyers to own uh, legal services firms. So, um, we talked about that. Tiago is saying, Thank you for your lecture and for sharing such thoughtful insights. Taking into consideration the acceleration of data analytics, do you believe that the big four will overthrow big law or even new players will emerge? If we move from a services market to a product market, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question, and and that that Armour Seiko paper is really interesting. Uh, I think is really good, and and I think I mentioned quite quite astute in in that regard. So um, there is a movement afoot. I think I mentioned it in my presentation to deregulate the legal services industry. It's happened in Utah. They've created a, a sandbox within which some experimentation will be allowed to happen. Arizona too. Uh, California is probably moving in that direction. California is, con con is convening a, um, a, it's called the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group. And that'll be a group of people who I think are gonna be tasked with considering you know, similar sandbox type initiatives, uh, you know, similar to what's happened in, in Utah and Arizona now. And so I think, I think the writing is on the wall that that sort of that relaxation of the lawyer's monopoly and that relaxation of fee splitting rules and, um, you know, non-lawyer ownership of firm rules, that's going to happen. And it's going to happen both because it was already happening, but I think it's, it's in particular, it's going to happen because of COVID, um, because I think COVID is going to produce a, a significant uptick in litigation. It's going to put huge pressure on courts, and that's going to create a, a new kind of set of, a renewed set of access to justice arguments for doing that kind of uh, deregulation. Now, keep in mind, some of the strongest advocates of deregulation have been the big four accounting firms, and that's important. So, um, you know, I just mentioned access to justice uh, issues and evictions and, um, you know, and, and consumer debt cases as driving this, but it, it really will be a, um, you know, kind of a strange bedfellow moment because you both have access to justice advocates who are who are hoping for these changes to the or this erosion of the of the lawyer's professional monopoly, but it's also coming from corporate precincts and in particular the big four. And so that's something I mentioned in my presentation, which is it's 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 you know all these things are predictions, but it's 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 and it's unclear, but it could be that relaxing the lawyer's monopoly and allowing for non-lawyer ownership, um, you know, has a whole bunch of capital flooding into a new product-based legal services model um, and produces a ton of innovation, but that innovation could very well have a corporate bent um, uh, because that's where the markets are. And so what you worry is that, the, that this, this relaxation of the monopoly actually produces a bunch of legal tech tools that are largely big entity facing 
Um, and, um, and, and then you also worry, uh, you know, in the UK, when they, when they passed their reforms back in 2008, you know, they were worried about, um, uh, oh, I can't remember what the term is. I, the, the, the equivalent term here would be like the Walmartization of litigation where, um, you know, you have a lot of legal services that are provided very efficiently and on the cheap, but also maybe without the quality control that we would, we would necessarily uh, uh, want. And so there's always going to be that concern too. So it could be the worst of all worlds. You could end up with corporate facing, uh, an explosion in corporate facing legal tech innovation at the high end of the legal services market. Um, and at the low end, um, you know, a set of offerings and kind of a Walmartization of, of, of legal services that, um, uh, that, uh, is not, uh, is not sufficiently protective of, 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 you know, of litigant interest kind of as a consumer protection matter. So uh, Mark's asking about uh, the seat set uh, issue and he's wondering if that goes away when uh, with uh, auto uh, machine learning. So what do we call continuous active learning? That was mm -hmm. the point that Judge Peck made in the, tin in the Rio Tinto case. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I have to, um, I, I think I have to say that I, I don't have the expertise to, to talk about that. I'm not, I'm not under the hood of TAR and predictive coding tools, maybe as much as I should. I, and th this idea that you could in some kind of unsupervised way, that is to say without that process of supervised learning whereby lawyers um, you know, flag documents manually, um, uh, but I don't even know how I started that sentence. But anyway, um, uh, uh, it, it's. It, I said in my in my discussion that it was that for the foreseeable future we were going to have. It was, it was it was much more likely that legal tech tools are uh, going to be that um, that symbiosis between lawyer and machine. It's it's going to require lots of hands-on lawyer engagement. Um, and so I take it the question then is okay. So what about the possibility that a machine could do this in an entirely unsupervised way? So you could you could you could literally input. Um, you know, all the documents to date in a case, um, including the discovery requests um, and the machine in an unsupervised way could actually go into an entity's ESI, it's electronically stored information and decide what's relevant and needs to be turned over. And also what is, um, you know, what is privileged and need not be turned over. Um, I don't know how close we are to that. I suspect we're not very close to that. And so that's consistent with, I, I think, what was one of the main themes of my presentation, which is that I think for the foreseeable future, certainly into that medium term, that five to 10 year window, I don't think we're gonna see unsupervised tools of that sort, but, um, but you never know. Predictions, predictions in the legal tech space and indeed in any technological space are always fraught. That, that's true, that's very true. So uh, then we have, uh, well, uh, Lena is asking whether you can share the, the, the title of the article by Richard Ray that you referred to. Mm -hmm. uh, she, um, that'd be great if we could put it in a text. Um, uh, yes, we'll make the recording available soon um, of the session, Mark. Uh, let me see. Um, Matthew is asking, might better um, TAR help the half knots in absolute terms, even if it doesn't help against the halves in relative terms? Better tech means cheaper, and wouldn't the have-nots benefit from that too? So it might even benefit from more. Mm -hmm. Might even benefit more relative to the half, half sort of a kind of a might it trickle down mm -hmm. to the have-nots in a sense. Sure, I think I think that's very possible. So if you if you think about what um, what the exchange of documents looks like, what what production of documents looks like in complex litigation, so the you know the the usual. Uh, so in a, in a case, the, you know, the, the usual mold for all of this is the plaintiff um, probably propounds more discovery requests on defendants. Um, and so there are requests for the production of documents that's, put, that's sent to defendants. Defendants then have to go through all their materials and decide what's relevant and what's privileged. And that's enormously costly and time consuming, especially like say in a big sprawling antitrust conspiracy case, that's the Twombly case. And so there'll clearly be cost savings on the, on the defendant side of things. But I suppose the argument then is that, okay, once those documents come back, so suppose um, the defendant actually produces, you know, looks at 20 million documents, but then produces 500,000 of those, then I think the thought is that TAR could bring efficiencies as to the plaintiff's review of those documents to find the truly relevant ones, the hot documents, the ones that are going to matter in, in the litigation. And so I suppose that's right. Um, uh, 
So I guess uh, I'm not sure that changes one of my conclusions, which is that I think there's going to be a narrowing of the cost asymmetries. And that's huge um, because, as I noted during my presentation, that has been an absolute preoccupation of rulemakers within the civil procedure space uh, in recent decades. And, um, you know, much like I, I, I'm not sure a majority is the right word, but a, but a large proportion, like a non-trivial amount of the rulemaking uh, in recent decades has been discovery focused and it's been motivated by this concern about costs and in particular cost asymmetries. And so if we narrow those asymmetries, it really does um, potentially lead to a pretty significant you know, shift in the, in, the, in, the, in the kind of the terrain, the landscape of civil procedure. David, thank you. We are already just a little bit over our time. I know a couple of people had more, more questions. Um, would they, could they... Uh... I'm sorry, I, I lost you. I think, uh, Roland, uh, you were asking if I'd be willing to stay on and chat. If that's the case, then the answer is uh, most certainly, most certainly yes. I am. I'm okay. glad oh, to. Fine. I'm that's glad fine. to do that. All right, that's fine. That that sounds great. So even better. So um, so uh, let me see. Uh, where did we start? So James asking, as an alternative to making predictive out outputs discoverable. Uh, what about requiring that legal tech tools used by a firm, whether from a vendor or in-house, must be available under FRANT terms to other parties? Thus, the decision of which tool to use and what inputs to provide remain protected work product, but all parties can at least theoretically access the same predictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So that, that would essentially be that would be compelled sharing of the technology even without, but, but not the actual inputs. Is that, is that the notion? Is that, is that your central end as to the, as to the, you know, the gist of the question? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with the um, Fran terms. Okay. Okay. Well, I, you know, I think, this goes to one of the claims that I made in, in the talk, which is that um, you know, there are going to be a, a lot of different forces uh, that shape the innovation ecosystem and that shape the trajectory of legal tech. And I think I mentioned that IP was one of those, how stringently we enforce IP um, rules in, in the legal tech space. Um, and there's no reason to think we wouldn't just apply conventional IP to them, but I suppose this may be a proposal that says, you know, maybe we relax those and maybe there's a legislated rule that says, you know, if you're using a tech tool within the confines of civil litigation, um, your, your outputs, uh, the machine, you know, the machine outputs that you use in litigation are very much protected by say the work product rule uh, and you need not turn those over to the other side, um, but the actual analytic system uh, you know, the actual piece of software must be shared. Um, that would be a pretty significant uh, uh, relaxation, I would think, of, of conventional IP protections um, uh, and, and, a, and a pretty significant reworking of the, you know, of the, of the work product rule. I'd have to think more about that. So one of the things that I've talked about and that others have talked about is, is the possibility of public option legal tech. So that's a really interesting idea. If we're worried that, that the haves of the litigation world have privileged access to these tools, um, then maybe there's a role not just for publicly subsidized accessible data, but even publicly subsidized software. And that's, uh, that, that also, by the way, is in the Ray and Solo Niederman paper. By the way, I have the site in front of me. The title of that paper is Developing Artificially Intelligent Justice. And the citation is 22 Stanford Technology Law Review 323. It's a 2019 paper and I highly recommend it. Thanks, David. Um, so Shugam's asking, uh, robot judges will be good tech which can decrease justice delivery time substantially, especially in my home country, India, where several million cases are pending and final uh, outtakes and, and, and take several decades. So any ballpark idea about timeline when robo judges can be envisioned as a reality? I think that timeline. 
Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm skeptical. Um, so I have done some work, I think I mentioned on government use of AI, and in particular, the types of machine learning tools that have been developed in the context of administrative adjudication of cases. So for instance, disability benefits determinations at the Social Security Administration in the United, in, in the United States. And we are a long, and there are some really interesting tools. There are some tools, for instance, an NLP tool that can flag errors in draft administrative judge decisions. But these are all low level errors and only a couple or maybe several dozen types of errors can be flagged. And that's the state of the current technology. And it seems like something like full on, you know, robo judge adjudication is, is a long ways off. Now I know Estonia is claiming that, um, you know, they're moving in that direction. There've been a lot of headlines about robo judges in China that I think uh, are actually, if, if you look, look carefully, are something far short of fully automated adjudication of cases. Um, and so, my view is that it is it is a long ways off. Now, what isn't as far off, I think, is the use of um, what's called ODR, so online dispute resolution platforms. And those are very interesting, and those are getting a lot of attention right now in the United States, at least, precisely because of COVID, because COVID has produced these upticks in very particular types of litigation, including um, landlord landlord tenant law, so evictions, um, and also consumer debt cases. And these are precisely those types of litigation that are quite technocratic, self-contained, um, and where you can maybe generate a fairly good prediction as to outcome. And so what does that mean for an ODR platform? Well, if a judge pushes a case to an ODR platform, says, I'm not gonna hear this, um, but rather parties go into this automated platform and figure it out, you can think of that platform as just a gathering place. It could just be a gathering place for the disputants to see if they can bargain their way to a settlement. Um, but even better, maybe that platform would provide a digitized actuarial calculation judgment as to um, you know, the likely outcome of the case. And so the most advanced ODR platforms that folks are developing right now are both a gathering place, but they also provide that prediction as to the likely outcome if it were litigated to a judgment in court. And so this is kind of the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, the BATNA. And the thought is that if you can develop ODR tools that are both the gathering place, but also have this predictive tool built into them, um, that those become very potent tools for resolving disputes because the parties are, can, can therefore negotiate in, in, a, in a somewhat more certain shadow of the law um, is, is, is the idea. And so we're not there yet. What's interesting is that judges are not especially receptive to these things. I think these ODR platforms are in a couple hundred uh, state and local courts around the United States. But my understanding is that none of them have that predictive component. Judges are not comfortable with the court providing, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 what would essentially be an advisory rule, ruling as to a case within the ODR platform. So these ODR platforms remain entirely, um, you know, entirely gathering places for the disputants to try to bargain their way to, a, to, to an outcome. Thank you, David. So Laura is asking uh, the last question, really. Um, so uh, great presentation. I was wondering why I have not mentioned no code platforms at all. How do you think they will influence lawyers work? Um, and, uh, and yeah, so uh, I think, I mean, your focus has been more on, on pred predictive analytics issues and NLP in uh, adversarial space. And uh, but overall, as we think about how technology can change legal practice overall, mm -hmm, I think most mm -hmm. platforms have a potential role to play, but sorry, I don't want to uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, answer the question for you, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you. So if, if I even understand what a no-code platform is, that that is uh, you know, a, a new kind of tool. I know there are some graduate students, actually know a couple of graduate students at Stanford who are working on it, but the idea is that you can, in plain language, develop like a bespoke tool to handle a particular task. So my, my understanding is that this is a way to create tools that perform various tasks, but without actual um, like coding knowledge. So, so um, I, and I think that's, I think that's what the no code yeah. is. So, uh, so, okay, so I'm getting a, so I'm getting a right. So my sense is that those can be quite powerful. Those sit a little apart from some of the things I'm interested in. You may have noticed in my presentation because I, uh, 
because I came back to it again and again and again ad nauseum. But I think the most interesting questions that are going to arise over the over the near to medium term are these like distributive implications and the use of tools that uh, produce outputs that um, you know that that advantage parties in quite direct ways within the confines of civil litigation. And so if I had to guess, and again, I'm not an expert on this, but that a no code approach is really good for lawyers working on um, you know, back office tasks or doing smaller scale tasks um, uh, within you know, representation of a client you know, within law offices. And so my guess is these are law office tools. They, they aren't as much tools that advantage you out in the world or in a court when you're litigating a case, but I, but I could be wrong about that. I, I do think that they are this very efficient way to produce little bespoke tools to perform tasks, and there's power there. There's power there above all else because it reduces the um, the cost of representation. And and I certainly talked about that plenty in my in my presentation. But hopefully you see that they're still a little different from a tool, for instance, that can predict an outcome and therefore arm a litigant with you know a better sense of what their settlement prospects are. Um, you know, which can be a, a a very powerful thing as one goes into a into a settlement negotiation. Yeah, I agree. I think the mostly relevant as a sort of means to capture a lawyer's expertise in a particular area, create workflows, maybe Q and A's, uh, you know, it's perhaps more relevant in a transactional context than in a, in a litigation context. Um, but David, thank you so much uh, for staying over time and taking more questions for your wonderful presentation. It's been really enlightening. I think uh, we had a great, um, um, uh, time with you and people are asking great, uh, very engaged uh, questions. So really appreciate your, your time. Uh, what a great way to kick off our, our speaker series this year. And, uh, and thank you again. So we'll give you all a virtual applause. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, thank you all. And uh, uh, next, so our next um, uh, speaker event uh, will be uh, in about a month from now. Uh, no, actually six weeks from now. Uh, we'll we'll have our next speaker series, so you will you will get an announcement uh, through our uh, listserv. And uh, yeah, thank you again, David, and uh, thank you all for joining us. All right, thank you. It was a real pleasure. All right, thank you. Bye bye.